If you question someone on which Japanese warship was unlucky, the first answer is almost always going to be Mogami. I have, after all, covered that ship in some detail for that very reason. However, one of the victims of that bad luck was her own sister, Mikuma, the first Japanese cruiser to sink during the Pacific War. She had the unfortunate fate of being rammed by her sister at the Battle of Midway. However, that's for later. For now, let's start with the design details. As I already covered this in more detail with Mogami, I'll stick to the basic information here. As a Mogami-class cruiser, Mikuma was one of very few ships intentionally designed to be upgunned. Initially commissioned as a light cruiser, with no fewer than 15 6-inch guns, this was only ever a stopgap. What the Japanese really wanted was more heavy cruisers. And as a result, the Mogami class was designed to swap guns. This made them heavy cruisers in terms of firepower, but the ships were otherwise lightly built, and for that matter, lightly armored. Still, it was an almost unique tale in naval history. For the technical details themselves, Mikuma, as commissioned, displaced around 11,000 tons at her full loading. The Japanese made the claim that her class displaced 8,500 tons, but this was a lie, and not a particularly good one at that. On that treaty-busting tonnage, Mikuma carried the aforementioned 15 6.1-inch 155mm guns. These were mounted in five triple turrets, with three on the bow and two on the stern. The stern guns were a fairly typical pair of super-firing turrets, one over the other. As for the bow guns, those were mounted with one turret super-firing over two others. To support the main battery, the Japanese fitted the cruiser with eight 5-inch, 127mm, dual-purpose secondary guns, and four twin turrets, two on either side of the ship, surrounding the funnel. The anti-aircraft battery would vary wildly over the career of these ships. Initially, it consisted of four 40mm pom-pom guns, although during the war, this would be replaced by a metric ton of 25mm guns. Numbers aren't always a good thing, though, when one considers the capability, or lack thereof, of those weapons. Mikuma wouldn't live to see many of those modifications, as we'll see. That said, to round out her weaponry, the cruiser carried four triple 24-inch torpedo tubes, mounted two to a side in the aft superstructure. In classic Japanese fondness for torpedoes, these tubes had spares carried nearby. That will also be relevant later. For the moment, though, let's round out the technical bits. Mikuma carried roughly equivalent armor to most light cruisers, with a 3.9-inch, 100mm thick main belt. This was thickened to 5.5 inches, 140mm, over the magazines. And, to wrap this up, all of this was pushed through the water at 37 knots by 152,000 shaft horsepower, through four shafts. With that done, we can shift to service history. This will be fairly short, both because she did relatively little in her early life, and the fact Mikuma didn't last out the first year of the war. Laid down on December 24, 1931, and launched on May 31, 1934, Mikuma's construction was a fairly typical affair. Her fitting out process was much the same, with the cruiser commissioned into the Imperial Japanese Navy on August 29, 1935. However, in common with her sister, Mikuma didn't have long before issues began to show up. Two particularly notable issues were actually related in the problems they caused. First, the Fourth Fleet incident on September 26, 1935 when the IJN discovered rather rudely that building ships as light as possible to skirt the treaty had actual consequences. 
with both stability and the strength of the ships. This would have required refits in its own right. At least one source makes note of another issue as well. Mikuma apparently popping welds in her gunnery trials. All the extreme weight saving came back to bite the Japanese. As a direct result, Mikuma required extensive reworking. This saw increased structural framing, the addition of hull bulges, and welds being replaced by riveting. All of this work added a good couple thousand tons of extra displacement and lowered speed to about 35 knots. However, this work would be the most interesting part of Mikuma's early career. 1936 through 1937 saw her being refit, and 1938 through 1939 was quiet and almost entirely dedicated to training and other such things. Even during the war with China, Mikuma had little to do. It would only be in 1939 that things notably changed. In that year, Mikuma, along with her sisters, was brought in for refit to swap these 6-inch guns with 8-inch weapons. These 203mm guns were fitted in twin turrets, lowering the number of guns in exchange for larger weapons. Mikuma went from 15 main battery guns to 10. She would also begin to pick up the 25mm guns at this point. All well and good, although it wouldn't change the general trajectory of her career. This continued with more training and patrols. That did change, however, in July of 1941. Specifically, on July 25th, 1941, Mikuma and her sister ships sailed for French Indochina. Modern Vietnam, in this case, as the cruisers arrived in Saigon on July 30th. This was to support the Japanese occupation of the French colony. The French really had no choice in the matter, and Mikuma would leave the very next day to return home. It wouldn't be long until the Pacific War began, so Mikuma didn't spend long at home. By December 4th, 1941, she set sail for Malaya. Mikuma was part of the southern Japanese forces in the invasion of Malaya. During this, she came close to running into Prince of Wales and Repulse, but the two fleets ultimately missed each other in the night. Mikuma wouldn't engage the British, and the British capital ships were sunk by air power on December 10th. After that, the cruiser would have to wait a bit before fighting the enemy. From December 1941 through to late February of 1942, Mikuma was on escort duty. The closest she came to engaging the enemy was shore bombardment from Malaya to various Indonesian islands. Well, that in a close encounter with the submarine USS Sea Raven on February 11th, 1942. Sea Raven closed in on a Japanese formation, including Mikuma, as they sailed for Sumatra. The submarine fired off a spread of four torpedoes, with two directed at Mogami and two at Mikuma. This being early 1942, and those being Mark 14 torpedoes, I don't think I need to say how that went. Mikuma and her sister continued right along, and with how stormy the weather was, they might not have even realized they were attacked. After supporting operations in Sumatra, though, this streak of missing enemy naval forces came to an end. While Mikuma was absent for the Battle of the Java Sea, she was present at the Battle of the Sunda Strait on February 28, 1942. Her sister Mogami would get probably the most successful single torpedo attack in Japanese history. It just happened to be against her own side, as four to five Japanese ships sank from Mogami's torpedoes. Transports, a minesweeper, and possibly a hospital ship. Sources disagree on the latter two. Mikuma, meanwhile, did not commit friendly fire. She simply pounded USS Houston and HMAS Perth. With support from other Japanese ships, Mikuma contributed to the sinking of those two cruisers. After this, though, nothing particularly exciting 
until April 1942. Mikuma and her sister Mogami were part of the Southern Group during the Indian Ocean Raid. From April 5th, 1942 through April 6th, this group sank several merchant ships. This April raid would prove to be Mikuma's final successful action. At the conclusion of the Indian Ocean Raid, the cruiser was sent back to Japan for a much-needed overhaul. After months at sea and in combat, Mikuma needed the work. It also served another purpose in preparing her for the long voyage to the Central Pacific, specifically to a sleepy little atoll named Midway. After the conclusion of the refit in early May 1942, Mikuma spent the rest of the month on working back up. Before, on May 26th, she was assigned to escort the Midway Invasion Force. This was a quiet job at first. The Japanese sailed across the Pacific without any resistance. It was only on June 5th, 1942, that things changed. At first, it was because of an order to sail ahead and bombard Midway. This came to nothing, as heavy seas kept the destroyer escorts from keeping up with the cruisers. Forced to break off this attack, Mikuma and her sisters returned to the main Japanese fleet. It was during this process, on the night of June 5th, that things went very wrong. Lookouts aboard the cruiser Kumano sighted an American submarine. USS Tambor was seen on the surface, and as a result, the Japanese formation was thrown into disarray. Kumano, the flagship, ordered a 45-degree turn to starboard to avoid potential torpedoes. The following mess varies a bit between sources. What can be said for sure is that Mikuma made a 90-degree turn, possibly to avoid colliding with Suzuya, turning a bit wider than Kumano. This ended up bringing her directly into Mogami's path. In the darkness of the night, Mogami's captain and lookouts didn't see their sister ship until it was too late. In spite of a heroic effort to turn at the last minute on the part of Mogami, the ship collided with Mikuma. The last minute turn made this collision less severe than it could have been. It still wasn't particularly pretty. A good 40 feet of Mogami's bow was crumpled in and pushed back alongside the ship. Mikuma, meanwhile, suffered relatively little damage. The damage she did suffer would prove to be her undoing, however. Her port side fuel tanks were ruptured, creating a massive oil slick behind the damaged cruiser. As Mogami limped home at 12 knots, Mikuma was ordered to escort her back, to cover her sister, and to repair her own damage. Although that oil slick was an issue. Through tracking it back to its source, PBY Catalinas spotted the cruisers. This led to multiple attacks from both Midway and the American aircraft carriers. Dive bombers and B-17s failed to do much on June 5th. On June 6th, 1942, that decidedly changed. Dive bombers from USS Hornet, SBD Dauntlesses, began to attack. While Mogami suffered hits here, Mikuma escaped with a near miss. A few hours later, a follow-on attack by 31 SBDs from Enterprise and Yorktown aircraft operating from Enterprise showed up. This time around, Mikuma was far less fortunate. Five bombs hit her directly, and two more were near misses. One hit the roof of her number three turret, the explosion severely injuring her captain. As his executive officer took command, more bombs hit. First, her forward engine room on the starboard side was wrecked. Then her aft engine room on the port side was disabled. The combination of all these hits set a fire amidships, which would prove to be the fatal blow. As Mikuma began to slow from the damage, the fires detonated her torpedoes. This caused fatal damage, including blowing out part of her hull beneath the waterline. The acting captain ordered the crew to abandon ship, with Mogami helping to pick up her sister ship's survivors, along with the destroyer Arashio. 
However, follow-up attacks from Hornet dive bombers cut this short. Mogami and Arashio were damaged, and most of the men had to be left in the water. Mikuma's captain would also die of his wounds later on. Mikuma ultimately sank, alone and abandoned, after Enterprise aircraft snapped the famous photographs of her smoldering hulk. Only about 200 of her crew survived the ordeal, leaving around 700 to die, either in the attack or the aftermath. As of yet, her wreck hasn't been rediscovered. I wouldn't expect it soon, either, since she's off on her own, and the aircraft carriers are the big-ticket items. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.